On today's Monday Night Travel, Gabe Gunning shares a trip report from his time in the Faroe Islands, a sea-battered archipelago located between Norway, Scotland, and Iceland. We'll start on the largest island of Stromoy, touring the Faroese capital of Toashaun, and ferrying to the quirky island of Nolsoy. From there, we'll drive up to the second city of Klokswik and use it as a springboard to the windswept northern islands. We'll then wind our way back through Esteroy and finish with a quick stop on Vagar. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Ben Green, and I have the pleasure of moderating tonight's exciting travels. Now, tonight's special guest is someone many of you know. He is my talented, well-traveled, well-organized colleague who is ready to share the incredible nature and culture he encountered in his recent trip. Please join me in welcoming Gabe Gunning. Hi, Gabe. Hello, Ben. It It's so strange for me not to be doing the Zoom controls. I keep wanting to hit all the buttons, but I just get to sit back and uh, be the guest tonight. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you, how does it feel to be on the presenter side of things? So which do you think you prefer? It's, I'm excited to do it. It's a lot of work. Um, so I am excited. We have a, a good show in store. Um, and I'm excited Absolutely. that I'm going to get to join you for a Q&A. Indeed. Now, Gabe, I think a lot of our viewers are familiar with you, of course, but maybe not everyone knows. What do you do for Rick Steves Europe mm -hmm. beyond Monday Night Travel? I do a lot of different things. I work on our brand marketing team. So in addition to my work with Monday Night Travel, I help organize Rick's events. I help organize um, different company campaigns that we do, um, such as when we released our new Rick Steves Italy for Food Lovers book, um, put together a big promotional campaign for that. Um, so yeah, just a lot of a lot of things here and there. Working on social mm -hmm. media posts as well. You do quite a lot, Gabe. We really appreciate you, that's for sure. Uh, now, what first inspired you to go to the Faroe Islands? I was trying to think of that today. Do you ever have it where there's something that you just has captured your curiosity, but you can't really remember when you first heard of it? It just feels like as long as I've known, I've wanted to go to the Faroe Islands. Um, I think it was probably about five years ago that I first heard about them. I think they were doing kind of a a great program, but also a bit of a marketing stunt um, for volunteerism, where they said that the islands were closed for travel for a week and only people that were volunteers that were going to help with trail maintenance could come. And I think that there were some stories about that going around in the news. And I think I heard about it then. I would still love to do that sometime, but it's competitive to get into. So I just went as as an ordinary traveler, not a volunteerist this time. Well, for whatever reason you decided to go ultimately, Gabe, um, we will all reap the benefits of the fact you did go. So I will hand it over to you. I know you have a lot to share with us. And thank you again for uh, for being the presenter tonight. All right. I'll see you in the Q&A, Ben. See you then, Gabe. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I am so glad to be, um, after three years of working on Monday Night Travel, it is such a privilege and an honor to be the featured guest this evening. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you a niche corner of Europe that a lot of people don't know much about. Um, I think it's very exciting. And we it's a small nation, but there is a lot to cover. So we are going to get going. So the Faroe Islands, um, first, what I want to establish before we even get started on what the Faroe Islands are is what a trip report is. So oftentimes on Monday Night Travel, we have people who are experts in their field, people who have lived in the cities we're discussing their entire lives, their scholars, their tour guides. I am not that person. I'm a traveler just like you. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, we had something at Rick Steves Europe called the World Travelers Club, where once a month, uh, travelers would get together with their curated slide decks, and they would share their recent travels um, as a way to both reflect on their travels, but also turn their travel memories into somebody else's travel dreams. And so that is my goal tonight. I am just a traveler that did a lot of research did a trip, 
learned a lot and wants to share about it with you. Um, I also want to be upfront about my sources. So obviously, I will draw mostly from my experiences. All the photos and videos that you'll see um, are from my camera. However, Rick Steves Europe does not have a Faroe Islands guidebook, so I'm going to recommend to you the Brat Faroe Islands guidebook by James Proctor. This was extremely helpful to me in my planning. The Faroe Islands also has a very well organized um, tourist information center and tourism bureau. So their website, um, visit faroeislands.com and guide to faroeislands.fo, were very helpful. And I also chatted with some other travelers. Um, all right, so Faroe Islands at a glance. So a few fast facts for anybody that's interested in traveling to the Faroe Islands. They are an archipelago of 18 islands between Scotland, Iceland, and Norway. Um, given that situation, um, it's probably not surprising that the best time to go is July and August. Um, it gets very chilly, and so those are the most viable times of year. I would avoid July 29th. That's their big national holiday, holiday St. Olaf's Day, so it can get very busy. Um, a lot of Faroese people that move to the European mainland will come home for that holiday. In terms of time to stay, it, I mean, you could be traveling for two weeks and still not see it all. Um, that said, I would say unlike Iceland, which the Faroe Islands are sometimes compared to, there's not as much variety of terrain. Um, the terrain is much more Scottish Highland vibes, and it's pretty consistently that way. So I think one week is just about right. Um, you won't see all the islands, but you're going to get a sense of what the terrain is like and still have time to visit the urban cultural centers. In terms of the weather, in the heat of the summer, it is 55 degrees in the day and 45 degrees at night. It was kind of remarkable how consistent that was. Um, so it is never terribly warm, um, but the good news is that it is in the Gulf Stream current, and so it stays fairly mild. One might think that with summer temperatures in the 50s, it would be below freezing in the winter, and it actually is just about 10 degrees cooler but it's just about always rainy. I went to the Faroe Islands assuming that it would be 50 degrees and rainy the entire time. And then if I got any sun at all, it would just be a pleasant surprise. And I ended up getting a decent amount. The currency is the Faroese kroner, which is tied to the Danish kroner. Um, be careful though, uh, because I assumed that since the two currencies were tied together, it meant that they were interchangeable. And so I went back to Denmark and I had some leftover Faroese currency um, and the they just said, we cannot accept this. So even though it's tied and it will always have the same exchange rate as Danish kroner, the bills can't be used outside of the Faroe Islands. So be aware of that. Fortunately, despite it being fairly rural, it was mostly contactless payment. Finally, in terms of planning ahead, really no sites require advanced planning, just lodging and guided tours, especially lodging. The Faroe Islands has a lot of interest, but not a ton of infrastructure with how quickly the interest has grown. So you really don't want to show up to the Faroe Islands, assuming that you'll just be able to find a place to sleep once you arrive. Um, the Faroe Islands is divided into six Sislur, uh, which translates to shire or counties. Um, I quickly realized in my planning that my six days was not going to be enough to visit all six counties. And most of what I researched said that if you have to cut something, you should cut the southern islands. They're just a little bit more difficult to get to, whereas the northern four counties are much more well connected and you can make the most of your time. So today I'm just going to be going over those northern four counties. Many wonder, how do you get to the Faroe Islands? You can go the old-fashioned way, the way of the Norse, um, and you can take the Smiril line, which operates ferries from both Iceland and Denmark. Each one of those leaves about once per week, um, and they both require you to go overnight, which could be a fun experience. However, most people just fly. There are three airlines that fly into the Vagar Airport in the Faroe Islands. Um, the most popular one, though, would be Atlantic Airways. This is the national airline of the Faroe Islands. It has daily flights year-round from Copenhagen, which is its main connection, but it has nine other European connections, 
And it actually, this past summer, um, they did a test flight a couple times a month uh, from New York Stewart Airport. Um, and so one of my dream vacations now is to go to New York City, have my big city adventure, and then fly to the Faroe Islands for a um, calm respite. So we decided to go with Atlantic Airways. Um, our flight left at 6 a.m. You can see in the photo that I had intended to do some research with my guidebook, but um, my priorities quickly shifted. Um, it was a reasonable price, though, and the flight was just a couple hours. And I did wake up in time to see us arriving in the Faroe Islands. It was a magical experience. And since we are traveling there together today, I want to give you that experience as well. So here we are descending into the Faroe Islands. So that you can see on the Atlantic Airway, um, their, their bird symbol and I, I had just built up so much expectation around this trip that I was honestly nervous that it wouldn't be able to live up to the expectations. But as soon as I saw those bits of green emerging from the clouds and that inland lake, um, my heart just got pumping, my adrenaline was up, and I was excited to explore this rugged landscape. The runway just kind of leapt up beneath us. They didn't have a very long runway given the terrain here, but we landed safely and we were eager to hop off the plane and get traveling right away. The first island that we're going to discuss is Vagar, because that is where the airport is in the town of Sorvagur. Um, and Vagar is nicely connected to many of the other islands. Um, and the first thing when you get out of the airport is you wonder, how am I going to get around this fairly remote area? There are public transportation options. Of course, there's ferries, which we'll discuss later. There are buses, and actually there are helicopters. Probably my biggest regret from my trip was not taking a helicopter ride. I assumed that they were expensive, but they're actually subsidized by the government. Um, and so they're actually fairly cheap in the Faroe Islands and a fairly common method of transportation. So I do wish I had known how cheap they were um, before I went and uh, that I had done that. Many people uh, decide to go with a guided tour. It can be a bit of a hassle to navigate all the ferries and especially in a place um, without a ton of infrastructure um, in terms of public transportation. My recommendation for most travelers though is to get a car rental. Um, this was our car for our trip, Suzy the Suzuki. Um, for six days, we paid $725, and that was for two drivers in the car, and then also it included um, the tunnels. So the Faroe Islands, they went tunnel crazy. There are at least 20 active tunnels. Three of them are underwater tunnels. Um, and one of the undersea tunnels is actually seven miles. And to help pay for those tunnels, there are fees to use them. Um, and so that $725 also included um, our tolls. Another quirk of Faroe Islands cars is they have these cute little clocks, which I'd never seen anywhere else. It's kind of an honor system for parking. When you park in a timed spot, you simply set the clock to whatever time you parked. And then when parking enforcement comes through, they can easily see how long you've been there. Um, and I love that aspect of island culture that they kind of operate on um, the honor system in that way. Um, on Vagar Island, the actually the last of all of the town populated towns in the Faroe Islands to be connected to the road system is the town of Gasadalur, um, which wasn't connected to the road system until 2004. You can see in the hill there, that little hole was the tunnel that they finally blasted through in 2004, making the town accessible by um, road. It used to be that the mail carrier would have to hike over the mountain to deliver mail um, every couple weeks. And they were hoping that the uh, the introduction of the tunnel might boost their population because it was at about 16 people. And if anything, it's now down to about 11. But it is a very cute village with a lot of traditional grass roofed houses. And it has one of the most iconic sites of the Faroe Islands, which is the Fossa waterfall. And you can see the town perched just above it. 
This is also a good time to introduce my travel partner for the Faroe Islands, my friend Micah Meyer. Those of you that tune in regularly to Monday Night Travel um, may recognize Micah from this past summer when he joined us for a show on the national parks. And I wanted to give him a special thank you for not only being a great travel companion, but also being my photographer and videographer throughout much of this trip. You'll also see that we are fairly bundled up here. As I mentioned, it is cold, but the weather can be very unpredictable. Locals like to say, if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. And it will very quickly change from sunny with beautiful cotton clouds, sitting on top of the mountains to rainy 10 minutes later. You'll be surrounded by clouds in the middle of a vast fog, or sometimes you'll get a beautiful mix of everything. One thing that's fairly consistent, though, is the wind. It is windy, very windy. In fact, to illustrate how windy it gets on the Faroe Islands, this is maybe my favorite video that I took the entire trip. This is probably the windiest day of our trip. Um, and you can see a waterfall that is being blown uphill. We dubbed it a water rise, um, but that is how intense the wind can be. So you definitely want to make sure that you invest in a good windbreaker, a good coat. You'll see almost every photo for this entire presentation. I'm in my burgundy Eddie Bauer coat, which kept me nice and warm. Um, I also made sure to pack a lot of different layers, which I then zipped up in my packing cubes, uh, put it along with all my summery clothes, because I also was in mainland Europe on this trip and needed to be ready for 80 degree weather, popped it all in my backpack, and you can see me at the airport able to carry everything on my back because I packed light and right. Um, a couple other noteworthy sites on Vagar Island before we move on. Just off the shore, there are two very famous sea stacks, which I'm going to struggle to pronounce, but Drangarnir and Tindalmur. Um, they are very beautiful. You can find much more beautiful photos online. And if you want, you can take boat, private boat tours out to those islands. Um, really, they're just going to get you close so that you can appreciate them up close and get photos. Um, but they are very iconic landmarks of the Faroe Islands. And one of the other most popular trips is traveling to the island of Mykines, uh, just off the west coast of Vagar. It is famous as being a very remote and rugged island and famous for its puffin colonies. This is also a popular place that people will take a helicopter to. Um, if I had another day in the Faroe Islands, I probably would have added on uh, Mykines. But alas, that is for another time. And right now we are going to continue on to Stramoy Island, which is the largest of the Faroe Islands. And we are going to chat a little bit about Faroese history. Now, of course, before there were Faroese people, um, the Faroe Islands were populated by a lot of wildlife. Um, one of the most prominent examples is birds. Um, the Faroe Islands is kind of a birder paradise. Um, it has the largest colony of storm petrels in the world. I'm not a birder. I don't know if that is a storm petrel. I, I don't think it is, but they have a lot of those. Um, they also have a lot of puffins, um, as I already mentioned. And one very common excursion is to take a bird watching tour. And the most common place to depart for that tour is West Mana, which is on the west side of Stramoy Island. Um, we hopped on a boat and went past these cute color blocked fishing sheds. And soon we were out amongst these craggy rocks. And I genuinely, the birds were great, but the most amazing part of the trip to me was how small of gaps the boat navigated. We would be approaching these caves and little crags, and I would think that there was no way that they would attempt to take a boat through there. And sure enough, um, they threaded those rocky needles, and soon we were staring up at these beautiful sea cliffs. Um, the birds weren't very close, but they were numerous. You can kind of see them confettied up above. Um, and overall, it was a positive experience. It was a little bit cookie cutter. It's a common thing for tourists to do, but it's a moderate price and it is nice to get out on the water and to be able to appreciate the islands from a boat. And so this is a fairly cost effective way to do it. However, birds are not the most famous 
animal residents of the Faroe Islands, that is sheep. In fact, Faroe Islands literally translates to the sheep islands. There are three sheep for every two people in the Faroe Islands, um, and all of them are property of a farmer. Um, so none of them are wild, but you will find them literally everywhere. You will find them on mountaintops. I saw one standing on top of the entrance to a driving tunnel. Um, they just kind of watch you go by as you're on your hikes. Um, and you will see them very frequently throughout the islands. The Faroese, not coincidentally, are also very famous for their wool products. And you can find a lot of those in the urban or relatively urban centers. There is one more bit of wildlife I want to mention, and that is whales. So earlier in the summer, I posted this kind of riff on the students going back to school photo with me going back to travel for the first time since the pandemic. And some people saw that I was going to the Faroe Islands and were concerned um, about the Faroe Islands practice of whaling. Um, this is, I, I was wondering whether or not to address it in the presentation, but we here at Rick Steves Europe really believe in not shying away from some of the difficult conversations in travel and flexing our travel as a political act muscles. So I did wanna just briefly address it. Um, the Faroe Islands, they do engage in whaling. Um, they have done this for centuries and for many centuries, it was kind of their only way to survive the winter um, was with the whale meat and the whale blubber. Um, and I think it's important to first make sure that we understand the facts before we kind of decide how we feel about it. So um, in terms of the facts, um, they hunt long, thin pilot whales, which are technically actually a species of dolphin, and they hunt them by driving groups of them into shallow waters. Um, and many people assume that all whales are endangered when um, in reality, these are actually um, listed as least concern. Um, there are approximately 800,000 long fin pilot whales in the ocean, and it's heavily regulated. Um, they're only, they only catch about 800 whales per year. It's overseen by Faroese officials. They need a license, and it's largely done and organized by the communities. So a community will organize a whale hunt, and then they will divide the whale meat and blubber amongst themselves. So actually very little of it goes to grocery stores or restaurants for commercial use. Now, those are the facts. Personally, candidly, I'm a vegetarian. I wish no animals ever died for meat personally. Um, and But I also think that not traveling to the Faroe Islands if you're upset about whaling isn't the answer. Um, in general, travel boycotts aren't super effective for two reasons. Um, one is that oftentimes they don't target the people that are actually doing the thing you dislike. In this case, the Faroese, they've been a fishing people for centuries before there was much tourism. And even if tourism was to stop, they would probably still continue this cultural practice. And secondly, is that there are no perfect places. I mean, just across the water in Denmark, they're the second largest producer of pork. By all metrics, pigs are as intelligent as whales or dolphins. Um, you know, in Spain, they have their bullfighting. Many parts of Eastern Europe have their, you know, um, kind of trend towards populism. And so we here at Rick Steves Europe just believe that in general, um, it's better to, if you're gonna wait for a perfect place to travel, you're never gonna travel anywhere. Every place has its flaws and it's best to go get to know people, share your thoughts on the issues and also hear theirs. Um, so that is kind of our, our thought, of course, if whales are really important to you, um, this might be an uncomfortable place for you to travel. Um, but just because you, people do go to the Faroe Islands doesn't mean they're anti-whale. In fact, the most effective thing that you can do is just when you're there, not eat whale. So um, I just wanted to quickly respond to some of the people that were concerned about that. And now we're going to progress from wildlife on to humans in the Faroe Islands. So this is one of my hardest words of the presentation. It is Cheshibur. Cheshibur is regarded as probably the first place that humans settled in the Faroe Islands. They think that likely the first settlers around 800 AD were Irish monks. 
And they chose to settle here in Sheshibur because there were two um, very important natural resources. And those are unexpectedly driftwood and seaweed. Now, those might not seem like hot commodities to you, but you try making a living in a land without trees. Turns out that driftwood is very helpful both for starting fires and for building houses. And the seaweed allowed them to fertilize the soil and eke out a very simple living um, with some basic agriculture. Soon though came the Norse and they displaced the Irish monks. And that's really when the Faroe Islands became kind of a hub of trade, especially. Um, and one of the most prominent, it also became an important seat of religious power in the Faroe Islands. And one of the most prominent examples is the Magnus Cathedral constructed around 1300. Um, notably though, it was never entirely completed because it has no roof. And most experts think that it never did. They think that either the islanders revolted um, after the heavy taxes um, that the bishop placed on them to create the cathedral, or perhaps that it was simply hard times um, after the Black Plague that caused production to halt. Even without a roof though, it is a very striking image today and actually quite impressive that they built walls that high given how strong the winds are along the coast. Even older though is St. Olaf's Church from about 1111. And this is still the church that is used by the community today. In the Faroe Islands, they are very religious, very Christian. Um, and even tiny towns have their own churches. I was in a church in the town of Aya, which we'll visit later. And I asked a gentleman there if they have even enough people to sustain their own preacher. And actually a lot of the churches will be grouped by region and they'll share a uh, pastor that will rotate between them and try to speak at each church about once a month. Another noteworthy building that shows um, the ancient roots of Chechibur is the Roikstavan farmhouse, um, which is the oldest inhabited wooden house in Europe feels a bit niche to me, but called the Guinness World Book of Records. Um, according to a uh, local legend, this building actually once stood on Norway's Sonja Fjord and was dismantled. All of its wooden beams were shipped across the water to the Faroe Islands and it was reassembled. And now actually 17 generations of the same family, the Petersen family, have called this their home. You can visit it, um, but our campground host, um, described the Faroe Islands as the land of maybe. And this was an example. Um, sometimes you go during listed open hours and it's just not open. So um, in the Faroe Islands, you do have to get used to, this happened to us a few times um, where it said that a restaurant would be open and we arrived and it was just closed for the day. So the Faroe Islands can be the land of maybe and you need to be prepared to be flexible. Also keep granola bars in your backpack. Next, we went to the town of Kwiwik, which also has an interesting little slice of Faroese history relating to all these difficult names I'm having to say. So let's take a quick peek at some Faroese language history. It was here in the village of Kwiwik that a major step was taken in the use of the Faroese language. For his New Year's Eve sermon, in 1855, Lutheran pastor Wenceslas Hammershaim delivered his sermon in Faroese rather than in Danish as was traditional. This caused uproar amongst congregants who felt that Faroese was not dignified enough for the word of God. People were so upset that Wenceslas would not deliver another sermon in Faroese and the Bible wasn't even translated into Faroese until the 1960s. Today, Wenceslas is considered a hero of the Faroese language. However, he is also blamed for its convoluted spelling system. Wenceslas was the one that created a standardized spelling for Faroese, but he made it in line with the Old Norse rather than with how people were actually pronouncing words. This means that school children have a lot of unpronounced letters to memorize, including the V in Tereshon, that never really appears. And um, it is also thanks to Wenceslas that I have all these difficult words to pronounce. Oh, but first, um, 
I think that there's great marketing minds at Faroe Islands Tourism. Um, they capitalized on the fact that Go their language is so niche that Google Translate doesn't actually offer Faroese. Um, and so they created Faroe Islands Translate, where travelers could submit phrases that they wanted to hear pronounced, and actual islanders could choose which phrases they wanted to translate um, and could record a video. Um, so it was a fun little um, marketing campaign for them. Um, but thanks to Wenceslas, I have all these great words to pronounce, um, like Kwiwik, Cheshibur, the capital uh, that we'll go to soon of Toashaun. Um, that little D with a line through it is never pronounced. So the next town that we see is Aya. We have Jacob, we have Villarea, and we have Chutnuik. Um, so the good news is that almost all the Faroese people speak English, so you don't have to worry about um, these too much. They are used to it. Um, but as a fun little game, the next place we're actually going to be going is Chutnuik, and you can, in my next video, try to count how many different pronunciations I have for the name of that town, because I definitely do not get it right every time. So now we are going to go for our first hike. We have three hikes in this presentation. Um, and our first hike is going to be from the town of Saxon to the town of Chattanooga. Hello from the tiny Faroese village of Saxon. Saxon is located on the western coast of the Faroe Islands largest island of Stremoy. And even though today it only has about 30 permanent residents, it's become a popular destination amongst Faroese day trippers who come here to see the traditional grass roofed church, the tidal lagoon that lies just below the village, and to visit the museum that showcases traditional rural Faroese life. Today, we are going to be hiking from Saxon to a village on the northern coast of Stremoy, Tjornebek, over this mountain. So, let's get started. Within minutes of hiking, we are already passing playful waterfalls, splashing through streams, befriending woolly locals, and enjoying jaw-dropping views from distinctive green peaks to the glassy lagoon below. The hike is long and challenging, but the terrain is remarkable. And once we crest the hill, we're rewarded with a breathtaking view of the snug village of Chornawik below. I imagine myself as a Faroese person scaling the mountain to visit family or collect supplies in a time before cars and roads. We follow along the colossal cairns toward one of the best natural harbors in the Faroe Islands. Finally, we hop across a bridge and we're among the traditional grass-roofed houses with the rush of waves and smell of waffles in the distance, beckoning us to the shore. All right, it was a challenging hike and it took three hours instead of the two that the sign said, but we are here in the town of Chutnawik and I would say that the hike was worth it. Today, Chutnawik is home to about 70 inhabitants, but it's also one of the oldest settlements in the Faroe Islands. They've discovered Viking burial grounds nearby. Today, it's also considered a surfer's paradise with a surf shop, shop just down the road. And also in the distance, you can see the two sea stacks that are called the Giant and the Witch that according to legend came to the Faroe Islands and tried to drag them back to Iceland. Fortunately, they failed and the Faroe Islands and Chutnawik are still here. We were also treated to a surprise lunch at a food truck of some vegetable soup and some rhubarb dessert. So our bellies are full and we are about to make the trek back over the mountain. Before we go though, We'll have one more helping of soup and watch Faroese families enjoy their slice of paradise. So this was actually on our first day in the Faroe Islands. Um, I was nervous that the weather was going to be terrible the entire time. And we had this one incredible, beautiful hike. And I just remember thinking to myself, even if the rest of the trip falls to pieces and goes terribly, we have this one beautiful day. Um, and fortunately, it was not our last beautiful moment. It was not our last beautiful day. Um, and we continued on. Um, and the next place that we are going to go was one of my other favorite places on the trip. That is the capital of Toashaun. 
Um, so after our hike, we were tired, we were a little chilly by the end, and we were ready to get settled in, to enjoy some culture, and to get some food in our bellies. And so now I would like to take you on a little tour of Toashan. Welcome to Toashan, the capital of the Faroe Islands and home to 20,000 of the country's 50,000 residents, making it one of the smallest country capitals in the world. Toashan literally means Thor's Harbor. However, the city is constructed on one of the country's worst natural harbors. Nevertheless, this small, plucky town is determined to be cosmopolitan with chic restaurants, cute shops, plenty of sweaters, warm cafes, and museums that catalog both the country's history and its art. It is a beautiful capital to explore, and we're going to take a look around now. The story of Faroese governance begins on the rocky peninsula of Tinkanes, and no trip to Toashan is complete without a visit. While Irish monks were likely the first people to settle the Faroe Islands, the 9th century brought the Norse, and they quickly became the dominant force here in the Faroe Islands. Around the year 900, they established a Ting, or a People's Assembly, on the rocky shores of modern-day Taoiseach, where they would debate development of the islands and settle disputes. It was a largely democratic process, prompting some to say that the Faroe Islands have one of the oldest parliamentary systems in the world. However, in 1035, the Ting decided that they would join the Kingdom of Norway, and gradually, over the next few centuries, the Ting lost power and control to forces like Norway, Denmark, the Hanseatic League, independent merchants, and pirates who sought to plunder the nation's natural resources and to control its trade. Eventually, Denmark emerged as the primary oppressor, and after a few attempts at independence, World War II shifted the scales. The Danes lost power, the Faroese gained power by providing fishing to the United Kingdom, and in 1948, the two nations settled on the Faroese Home Rule Act, which determined that the Faroe Islands is a self-governing community within the Kingdom of Denmark. The government of the Faroe Islands was reestablished here in Tinkanes, and now these former red grass-roofed warehouses, rather than housing goods, now house ministries such as the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Taxation, and most importantly to Faroese, the Ministry of Trade. They even have the office of the Prime Minister right here. A few steps from Tinkanes, we suddenly find ourselves in Toashan's oldest neighborhood. Just north of Tinkanes is the city's oldest neighborhood of Rain. It's a cobbled together assortment of grass roofed house, colorful buildings, and niggling lanes. You're welcome to walk through. The locals just kindly ask that you please don't peek in their windows. People still live here. Also in Rain sits the Toashan Cathedral. And while the exterior is unassuming, the interior is striking. A pipe organ nestles in the curved balcony and model ships dangle from the starry blue ceiling. One, a gift from shipwrecked sailors saved by the Faroese. In addition to its historic sites, Toshan also has more modern amenities. Chic eateries, lively public art, soccer fields for the Faroese national team and kids alike, a startlingly scenic track, pleasant riding paths, and an excellent art museum. The Lista San Fruyard Art Gallery makes it its mission to catalog Faroese culture through its art. It showcases local sculptors, portrait artists, painters, and even knitters in exhibits that showcase how Faroese society is sculpted by the natural environment around it. The greatest force in Faroese culture is the sea, and the first exhibit is dedicated to its shifting moods. From serenely calm and glazed in sun, to dark and brooding, crashing against the rocks, the fickle sea safely harbors boats one day and dismantles them the next. Other rooms are dedicated to other prominent aspects of Faroese life. Rocks, birds, sheep, country life, 
small towns, and big cities. Well, by comparison, that is. Overall, the National Art Gallery sends a clear message. The Faroese people share a spiritual connection with the dramatic natural world around them, and both nature and culture are alive and well in this small nation. But despite all of the great culture in Taoshan, one of my favorite things to do is to simply go get a chai latte and hang out with locals and tourists alike at the Panam Cafe. I was at the Panam Cafe a lot. <laughs> I became, that's, if, if anywhere, that's where I became a temporary local. Um, so those were some of my favorite sites um, in Toishan. I was actually, I knew that the Faroe Islands was gonna be just a natural paradise, but what really surprised me was how much I enjoyed the culture. Um, and especially the art museum was probably one of my top five favorite museums I've ever been to. Um, it was very small, manageable. You could see all of it in about 90 minutes, but it felt like taking a tour of Faroese culture. Um, so highly recommend that. Other noteworthy sites, though, they do have a fort, uh, the Skansen Fort. Um, the Nordic House celebrates the Faroe Islands connections to its Nordic neighbors. And then there is um, a national museum and an open air museum, uh, which I would love to get to if I have more time on my next visit. I want to take this opportunity, as Toashan is likely to be a hub for a lot of travelers, to talk a little bit about some logistics. So first, lodging. Um, this might not be applicable to a lot of you watching. Um, if you are an indoors person, if you want to sleep indoors, there's plenty of Airbnbs. You can find plenty of hotels. Um, a lot of them are on the tourism website. But Micah and I chose to go cheap and camp. And I think it was a very wise decision because we had beautiful views for exceptional prices. In Toashaun, we just paid $17 per person per night. And in Aya, we actually had an even more beautiful camping site. And it was just $17 for both of us for a night. Um, you can't just camp wherever in the Faroe Islands. You have to camp at designated campgrounds. Sometimes they're beautiful. Sometimes they're just old soccer fields. There are also plenty of people that camp in caravans rather than in tents, um, but it is a very cheap way to travel um, if you just pack some warm layers. Um, and in terms of eating, uh, I will say if you are a foodie, the Faroe Islands might not be your favorite place. There are many great things about the islands, but the food is a little bit sparse. And if you want traditional cuisine, they really have fish and meat and potatoes. Um, so especially as a vegetarian, um, I did not go for the more traditional fare. However, there was plenty of good food. We did not go hungry. We got some Thai takeout. We got some pho at a trendy eatery. We went to a sports bar one night and got um, burgers. They actually had really good vegetarian options. Probably the most um, uh, kind of local thing that I consumed was the Green Islands Stout by the uh, Faroe Islands Brewery, which is the only brewery on the islands. Um, but I would say you will not go hungry, but don't, ex don't expect for some very um, niche and delicious food experiences. Um, that said, again, my favorite was the Panam Cafe. It was just a, a run-of-the-mill cafe, but it had kind of the, the pulse of the city. It was always filled with people. It was always vibrant and I can never say no to some cake. Moving along, we are going to take a day trip to Nolsoy. This is one of the most popular day trips from the capital of Toashan. It's just off the coast, um, and it just has one main settlement also called Nolsoy. You just hop on a passenger ferry. This is us going by Tinkanes, um, where the government offices are, departing for the Faroe I or for Nolsoy Island. And we arrive in Nolsoy. You can see the town perched behind us in the distance. A lot of places in the Faroe Islands have, islands have these excellent informational plaques that tell you all of the sites to see, where they are, if there's a hike, what the route is, what the difficulty level is. So they have a very good infrastructure around tourism at their major sites. Um, Nolsoy has a lot of pride. It's known as being kind of a 
artistic and eclectic community. They also even have their own tourism office. And if you ask at the front desk and pay just a small fee, they'll open up a warehouse next to the visitor center and show you the most prized artifact in all of Nolsoy, which is the Diana Victoria. Um, it is the rowboat of their local hero, Ova Ewensen. And I would like to share his story with you now. In July of 1986, Nolsoy local Ova Ewensen decided to row his boat, the Diana Victoria, from here in Nolsoy all the way to Copenhagen to raise funds for a local swimming pool to teach kids how to swim after a few incidents of kids drowning off the shores of Nolsoy. This was his third attempt after two failed attempts the previous years, and he used funds from various donors and sponsors to make the journey and begin funding the swimming pool. Unfortunately, the swimming pool proved a little bit more expensive than planned, and with the dawn of wetsuits that allow kids to practice swimming in the harbor, the community has decided not to complete the pool. However, they still have an annual festival in early August celebrating their hometown hero, Ova, with over 6,000 people coming here to Nolsoy to celebrate. So on our trip, the that celebration of Ova Ewensen actually came um, just the day after we left. Um, I was disappointed. I wished that we could have celebrated with the people of Nolsoy, um, but he is one of their local heroes there. Um, another local hero we can actually see on this sign is, if you see the yellow sign in the middle, the Birdman. Um, so we actually just walked down the street, we followed the sign, and we happened upon Jens Jensen just as he was arriving home from the grocery store. Um, out of politeness, I didn't take any photos of him, um, but I did take photos of his work. He is a taxidermist, um, and not only is he a collector of birds, he is also a collector of bird lice. He has the largest collection of avian lice in Europe, so uh, get the Guinness World Re Book of Records back on the phone. Um, it was fun to page through these with him, and he was kind of the definition of a local character. One of the most popular things to do on Nolsoy is to hike to the lighthouse, which is on the opposite end of the island. You have to go over the big mountain in the middle of the island. But given our hike the day before and the cloud situation, we decided just to waltz around the city for the day. And it was really fun to return to Toashan afterwards and have this view of Nolsoy and the little town there um, and just knows know a couple of the of the people that live there. From here, we are going to go up to the northern islands with a special focus on the remote island of Kalsoy, which was one of the highlights of the trip. Um, first, though, we had to go to Klax Week. This is not a great photo, but I included it because it is a cool thing that it is a photo of, which is the world's first underwater roundabout. So in that seven mile underwater tunnel, there is this roundabout which features um, lighting design from local artists. And there's actually a radio station that you can tune into that has music specially designed for the tunnel. Soon we popped out into Klaks Week, which is the second largest settlement of the Faroe Islands and the springboard to our next adventure. So we're gonna take a moment to explore Clocks Week and then go and uh, have our second hike of this presentation. So grab your granola bars and here we go. We are here in Clocks Week, which is the second. I should also say this was the windiest day of the trip and was the one day that my microphone decided to quit. Um, so a big thank you to our video editor, Zen, for dutifully putting in these subtitles. The largest settlement in the Faroe Islands with about 5,000 inhabitants. While Clocks Week started with farming during the 19th century, they turned to fishing with their beautifully protected harbor and has become one of the primary fishing places in the country. While nowhere in the Faroe Islands really rises to the definition of city, Clocksweek does feel like the second city of the Faroe Islands. A little bit more industrial, but with the city's trendy brewery and an interesting mix of grass-roofed traditional houses and more modern 
Danish style buildings. It is a beautiful place to explore and the gateway to the Northern Islands. In just a few moments, we're going to be hopping on the ferry to the island of Kalsoy. So we're going to explore for a few minutes before that. After a quick walk around Klaxvik, we hurry to the Kalsoy Ferry. The ferry is small and ferry schedules are sparse, so it's important to think ahead and develop a sound ferry strategy. Hello fellow travelers, we are here on the ferry from Klaxvik to Kalsoy Island. Um, this ferry only takes 12 cars, so we made sure that we parked our car right after the previous ferry departed, and we also left in the afternoon. There are a lot of people that day trip here, so the fact that we were staying the night means that we ended up having less competition for this ferry that's going in the afternoon. Um, it is a bit of a rainy day, but we're excited to get going. The ferry sets out, and soon the soaring northern islands materialize from the atmospheric fog. Winds can be strong and waters can be rough, so buckle up and let the sea rock you to sleep. A nap will serve you well before your Kalsoy adventures. As we approach Kalsoy Island, the bow of the boat opens its jaws and we're treated to our first glimpse of Siradalur, the first of four villages running south to north on the island's one main road. Once the ferry docks, Cars are guided out one at a time. And within minutes, we're on the one-lane road strung like a tightrope across the length of steeply sloping Kalsoy Island. I just want to pause for a second. When I said that there were sheep everywhere, be sure to look above this tunnel when we're about to go through it. Our destination, the Kalur Lighthouse at the island's northern tip. However, the journey there won't be easy because Kalsoy Island has a unique obstacle for drivers, one-lane tunnels. We take a deep breath, cross our fingers, and hope that no cars are driving toward us. Pullouts are carved periodically along the tunnel to allow cars to pass, but every turn is still filled with suspense. Fortunately, we make it through without any automobile encounters, and we emerge to more beautiful views of Kalsoy. A few minutes more, and the road ends at the northernmost village of Kalsoy Island, Trolanes, where our drive ends and our hike begins. We are on Kalsoy Island at the very northern tip. The northernmost of the four villages is Trolanes, literally Troll lanes known for its trolls and we are about to do the Kalur lighthouse hike which is one of the most popular hikes in the north islands so we are going to get started and i will see you at the top we pay our hiking fee shut the gate behind us so no sheep escape and begin our ascent the hike is steep, the footing is muddy, and the wind is unrelenting. But we slip on our gloves and pull our hoods tight, and after about a mile of hiking, the remote lighthouse is in sight. A final few well-worn steps, and we arrive, at last, at the Kalur Lighthouse. All right, we made it to the Kalur Lighthouse on Kalsoy Island. It is behind us more of the northern islands. I see Hunoi right next to us. Right behind us we have an incredible sea cliff. And if we look in the distance we can even see Stremoy Island where we were earlier. And I can see the giant and the big rocks just off the shore of Tournament in the distance. It is windy up here but it is beautiful and Before we bound back down the mountain, there's one more thing we need to do. Admire the birds that nest on the enormous sea cliff, including one of the Faroe Islands' most famous and adorable residents, puffins. They're so cute! And they're hovering in the air, letting the wind kind of hold them in place and their feathers ruffle and they just zoom. 
With whimsical wildlife, dramatic geology, and unparalleled views, it's easy to see why the Kalur Lighthouse hike is one of the busiest hikes in the Faroe Islands. However, if you plan to stay the night on Kalsoy Island and hike just before the gates close for the day, you could have those views all to yourself. I'd say it's worth it. So, uh, yeah, it does not look like from that clip that it's one of the busiest hikes in the Faroe Islands, um, but it is. Actually, I didn't mention it in the video, but those of you that are James Bond fans, um, the last James Bond movie where, spoiler alert, if you're planning on watching it after a couple years and haven't, plug your ears, but he dies at the end. And that is at the northern tip of Kalsoy Island, right at the lighthouses where it was filmed. And so actually right at the base of that sea cliff, somebody has erected a grave to James Bond, which is another reason that you get a lot of travelers there. Um, I think it's worth it just for the beauty. It is important to note, though, that there is a hiking fee, and this is kind of a new tension in the Faroe Islands. While the islanders are generally happy to have tourists there, there actually is no right to roam on the Faroe Islands. All of this land is property of somebody. Um, and understandably, there are some farmers that, you know, feel like there should they should be given payment for people to go tromping, dozens and dozens of people to go tromping up and down their land every day. Um, at first, I kind of balked at this. I like the idea of the right to roam. But I thought of it like here in Washington state, we have to have a lot of permits to park at the trailheads of certain trails that go towards the maintenance of the trail. Um, I'm sure that they've lifted the price a little bit more above just the cost of maintenance. Um, but these hikes, some of the hikes do have a fee. Um, this one I was able to just pay by card. They had even in this rural place, just a little um, card reader and we were on our way and I do think it was worth it. Um, we then went down to the town of Mikla Delur, which is the most populated town uh, on Kalsoy Island at about 30 residents. Um, and fortunately, we invested in a camp house. This was just $58 a night, but it was brutally windy. And we were so glad that we made this reservation in advance, um, even though we still slept on the ground. Having four walls around us to protect us from the wind was extremely appreciated. And there was a kitchen, um, so we were able to cook up our own little meal. I assume that there would be salt and pepper at the place, and there were not. So I just want to say I made this meal without salt, without pepper, and without oil, and it was passable. Uh, we also had a little dessert. Um, and the next morning, we woke up refreshed to see another famous character from Faroe's legend, the Seal Woman. One of the most popular sites of Kalsoy Island is the Seal Woman sculpture in Mikla Delure by sculptor Hans Pauli Olsen. The sculpture commemorates the story of the Seal Woman, who was one of many seals that once a year would come to the shores of Mikla de Lure just after sunset, shed their skins and dance all night as humans on the shores. Then just before sunrise, they would slip their skins back on and disappear into the water. One of the male villagers hearing about this decided to hide behind a rock and watch the festivities. Seeing one particularly beautiful woman, he decided to steal her skin and lock it away in a chest so that she had to stay here with him in Mikla de Lure. He married her and had a family with her and kept the key to the chest tied around his belt. One day though, while he was out fishing, he forgot the key at home and the seal woman, not missing her chance, retrieved her skin, put it back on and dove back into the ocean. So the Faroe Islands, despite being a very Christian and religious nation, also has a lot of its fun, playful myths that they like to commemorate. Um, and the seal woman is certainly a striking one, especially with that sculpture. That was an example of um, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, we didn't hop any fences to get down there, but right after we filmed that, we did get a little bit scolded and told that we probably shouldn't get so close to the ocean. So. Um, 
keep your distance. Maybe don't go that close to the seal woman um, if you're able to visit yourself. Um, after that, we hiked up the hill to what I think is the only restaurant on Kalsoy Island, and that is Cafe Edge. It is only open, I think, in the summer, two days a week for about five hours a day, but we timed it just right, and I'm so glad that we did. It was so cold, and they just had this adorable handwritten menu. They were mostly just serving hot soup bread and desserts and hot chocolate. And I could not imagine anything better. Um, it warmed us right up. And I also was able to have a great conversation with the uh, person that managed the cafe who actually was very chic and hip and was probably in her 20s or 30s and was a digital nomad most of the year in other parts of Europe, but came home. She actually grew up in Mikla Delour and would come home to run the cafe in the summer. And so getting to meet a local was a fantastic experience. We then drove back down and we hopped back onto the ferry. And again, I just want to clarify, you have to get to the ferries early. We arrived, I think, at least 90 minutes early, and we were the second to last car to get on that ferry, and the next ferry wasn't for a couple of hours. So if you are going to drive onto a ferry to a remote island, you have to be prepared to wait. Um, a couple other major sites in the Northern Islands. Um, there is a mountain I'm not going to try to pronounce, but then there's also Enneberg, which is one of the, world, the world's highest sea cliffs. Um, you can hike to it. It is one of the hikes that has a fee, and it is extremely strongly recommended to go with a guide. There's also two other islands that you need to take a ferry to get to. That is Svinoy and Fugloy, um, which are definitely more remote islands uh, for people that want to get off the beaten path. The final island that we are going to go to today is the island of Esturoy, which is the second largest island, and we are just going to finish up our tour here by enjoying a couple supremely charming little towns, um, criminally charming. Um, the first one that we're going to go to is Jacob. Um, this is, you can see uh, Micah on the bridge there. You can see some kids playing on a little raft um, in this little stream and just all the beautiful colorful houses. And that is Kalsoy in the distance um, with the cloud just sitting on its back. Um, it has fantastic views. It also, for people that don't want to be camping, uh, Jacob has a great guest house that also puts on cultural events meant to educate travelers. Uh, so I believe I linked to that in the chat. Um, and Jacob actually means gorge. Um, and you can see it has this beautiful undulating water that uh, goes in and out of the gorge. This is definitely one of my favorite. Uh, and after our visit to Jacob, we then went to another adorable small town of Aya. Uh, you can see their soccer field there. Even tiny towns in the Faroe Islands have their own soccer fields. They have to train the next generation of uh, players for the national team. Again, quintessential grass roofed houses, looks pretty typical, um, but you can see this was our campsite. That's our blue tent just perched right along the water um, on this inland lake that is right next to the ocean, and we enjoyed just watching the sun set over the ocean. The last tiny town we're going to stop in is Leosa. Um, it is more than just this one adorable building, but that uh, was th the best shot. Uh, but the Leosa is literally maybe 10 buildings, but one of those buildings is an amazing one. It is the building for Rose's Cafe. Like I said, there are not many fantastic blow you out of the water culinary options. Rose's Cafe was phenomenal, well run, great food. Um, Still mostly fish and chips and salads and burgers, but done at a very high level. Um, and I had actually researched this before I went and I knew that Rose was initially from Ethiopia and I was crossing my fingers that I would be able to ask her how she started in Ethiopia and ended up in the Faroe Islands. And fortunately for me, Rose was very chatty. Um, she basically had to fight tooth and nail for her education growing up in, as a woman in Ethiopia. 
Um, but she eventually made it out of Ethiopia. And while she was working in Bahrain, she met her husband, who is a Faroese fisherman. And she relocated to the Faroe Islands. And when she learned that I lived in Seattle and worked in Edmonds, Washington, she ran to her shelf and she got her Edmonds Community College cup off of her shelf. It turns out that she wanted to get her culinary degree and was researching um, culinary programs that serve people for whom English wasn't their first language. And she saw that Edmonds Community College was highly recommended. So right where I'm sitting right now in Edmonds, Washington, she studied for a couple of years, got her culinary degree and went back to the Faroe Islands to open her cafe. It is kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it is worth a visit and Rose is delightful. Other states on Estoroy, uh, there's a couple more adorable little towns like El, El Duvic and Onya Fjorder, Fjord. Um, and then there's also a music festival that happens every summer, the G Festival in Gotha. So we have been on a long journey and I have saved one last hike for the end. We are going to finish this tour of the Faroe Islands by summiting the highest peak in the Faroe Islands and one of my more difficult words, uh, ending on a hard one, Sleiteratintur. So please join me for one last hike and one last glimpse at the Faroe Islands as together we scale Sleiteratintur. We are here at Sleiteratintur, the highest peak in the Faroe Islands at 882 meters. In Faroese, it actually means flat peak. So while we have a steep ascent, we're gonna have a nice flat peak, hopefully with gorgeous views over the Faroe Islands on this beautifully sunny day. So let's get started. The trail does not waste time in charging directly up the steep mountainside. We go up. And up. And up. We also learn that while the Faroe Islands may be one of Europe's best kept secrets, once you're here, Sleiter Tintur is no secret. It's a popular hike, and on a sunny summer day at mid-morning, it is crowded. The small parking lot is packed with cars, and the trail is busy with hikers in pursuit of a 360-degree view. Another popular day on Sleitera Tintur is the summer solstice, when locals clamor to the peak to watch the sun set on spring and rise on summer a few hours later. They spend the dark hours in between doing traditional chain dancing at the summit, but we have fun with a different kind of chain as we near the top. On a clear day, you can see all 18 of the Faroe Islands from the peak of Sleitera Tintur. But as we approach the summit, we find ourselves in a race with some encroaching clouds. Well, it was a steep hike, but we are here at the top of Sleitera Tintur, 882 meters up, or 884 in my case, and just behind us the clouds are moving in, but we get some final glimpses of Esteroy, some lakes, some fjords, some ski stacks, and some fellow hikers. We'll enjoy a few minutes at the top, and then we'll head back down. While we may not have beaten the clouds, sitting at the top of Sleitera Tintur and overlooking the islands we've spent the past week exploring, is a perfect way to cap off an incredible adventure in the mystical, whimsical, sensational, and unforgettable Faroe Islands. Thank you for joining me on this tour of the Faroe Islands. It was a jaw-dropping journey that took us through soaring peaks along magnificent fjords, past color-blocked villages huddled along the shore, and also offered us glimpses at Faroese history and culture while giving us time to connect with the Faroese people. It was an unforgettable journey for me, and I hope that you are able to visit the Faroe Islands yourself someday soon. The views speak for themselves.
All right. Well, Ben, that is our trip um, on the Faroe Islands. I also wanted to clarify, if you want to do that hike, you do not need to go up one of the chains. There are many more gentle routes. <laughs> Oh, Gabe, that was so inspiring. I didn't know hardly a thing about the Faroe Islands before tonight, but now I'm like, I gotta go. I they they really are phenomenal. It is, it is, they say it's one of Europe's best kept secrets, and I would agree with that. And the way you created and weave together these videos and slides, uh, very well done. Thank you so much for taking the time to put this together for us. Well, and a big thank you to our video video editor, Zen, that put in a lot of time and work on those. And your video videographer or cameraman, of course, on the trip yes, as well. Yes, and Micah, also long-suffering in doing multiple takes with me. <laughs> well, you know, Gabe, that we have some excellent questions forthcoming. But first, let's do the word from our sponsor this evening. And it's a great one, especially for uh, what you've shared with us tonight, where we went. So why don't we let our webmaster at Rick Steves Europe, Andrew, tell us a bit more. All right. Hi, I'm Andrew Wakeling. I'm the webmaster for Rick Steves Europe. And when I'm not updating ricksteves.com, I get to oversee and moderate the Rick Steves Travel Forum. Let me show you. Here's our homepage, and you can find the travel forum over here in our website's navigation. You can find it from our homepage or any page on ricksteves.com. Once you're here, you'll be presented with a wealth of travel information. It's a great place to give and get travel advice for your upcoming trip. We've got three main areas in our forum. There's the destination Q&A area where most of you will find your advice, and it's all segmented by destination. Over here, we've got tips and trip reports and hotel and restaurant reviews. Uh, if you're new to our forum, you can register for an account or you'll be prompted to register for one as you use our forum. So happy travels. And I will for... to showcase that tonight, Ben, because if you, like Andrew said, there is a whole section for trip reports. So if you've been on a trip, if you wanna use your experiences to inspire other people's travels, the Travel Forum is just a free user-generated space that we offer up to all you travelers for that, um, such as the Faroe Islands. I think tonight is the first time Rick Steves Europe has covered it, so it's especially a good resource for places that you know we don't already have great guidebooks to. Well said, Gabe, indeed. And it's a very active community on there as well. All right, are you ready, Gabe? Are you prepared for my questions? <laughs> uh, I have my guidebook here if I need to look something up. So mm -hmm. yeah, let's go. Bring it on. I'm, I'm going to hit you with quite a few, I think. Uh, <laughs> Kathy is wondering, Gabe, do you know, do icebergs make it to the Faroe Islands? No, no. So I mean, the Faroe Islands, they will get snow in the winter. But like I said, the typical low in the Faroe Islands is 35 degrees. So you will get snow, but it's not going to be, a, you don't see icebergs floating by offshore. No. Do you know why there are so few trees? Is it the climate? Um, it is, I mean, really no place in the Faroe Islands, no point is more than five kilometers from the shore. And so given the high wind speeds, um, across these relatively small islands. It's just not really a type of terrain where trees can grow. There was, it was actually a little bit um, kind of uh, a strange experience around the capital of Toshan and the city Hoibik to the north. They did have a brief forested path. I don't know if that was naturally occurring or if they kind of cultivated it that way, but I did read that there's a park in Toashan that has trees, but that they regularly have to be maintaining it and like replanting trees because the wind will blow them over. Very interesting. Um, Lisa is wondering, Gabe, uh, perhaps you could say a few words on the character of the, the residents of the Faroe Islands. Did you find that it was similar to Denmark or, or Europe or was it different? Yeah, I would say it is. So, I mean, the Faroe Islands are pretty much genetically the same people that populated much of Scandinavia. So you can expect a lot of similarities there. 
of course, these are people that choose to live in a fairly remote place. So I wouldn't expect people to be really effusive and bubbly and go out of their way to chat with you. But everybody that I talked to was extremely friendly. I was going up to people like, how do I pronounce Ch Chor Chornowick? And they were very sweet in telling me how to pronounce things. So everybody, if you're respectful, they will be very friendly. And I mean, also getting con to connect with people like Rose, who, you know, is not Faroese herself, but there's a lot of people that end up in the Faroe Islands that I feel like have very interesting stories. It's a place that you kind of go to intentionally. Susan is wondering, did you go jogging? And if you have any comments on the jogging past of the Faroe Islands. Uh, this is Susan. Yeah, yeah Susan. My, so Micah is also a runner. We ran pretty much every other day while we were there. Um, maybe not on the days that we did hikes, but we, one of the great things about being, especially in Toashan, which, you know, is the capital. So it has kind of this, a little bit of a metropolitan feel to it but you don't have to run very far to be in the countryside. We actually went to the track. There was a brief clip of it, of me running along the track. One end of the track, you're looking out over the ocean. The other end, there's like a mountain. And then just beyond the track, you descend into all of these trails going past waterfalls and countryside. It was one of the best runs I've been on all year. We were kind of like kids in a candy store. It was like every turn that we took led to something even cooler. Um, which I always say running on vacation is a big hassle a lot, a lot of times making time for it, but it often leads to some of the best experiences. I can just imagine how happy you were during that jog game. Oh, it was, yeah, like runners high times 10. It was so good. <laughs> now, uh, you've said a few words about prices, but could you perhaps give us some perspective of, of prices on the Faroe Islands? similar to the continent like Denmark or? Um, I I would say on the whole cheaper than the rest of Scandinavia. Um, I'm trying to remember back now to like how much a meal would cost me. Um, I don't, I mean, I put the prices for like my camping and the, the hiking fees, but I'd have to look back on my receipts from like, what's the cost of a cup of coffee? I remember it feeling like it was a little bit cheaper actually than at least Copenhagen, you know, at least some of the big Scandinavian cities. Um, I found it to be quite affordable. That's impressive considering a lot must be imported, I presume, right? Yeah, yeah. I think certainly, I guess it depends what you're getting. I did remember the one trip that I went to a grocery store it was like 10 minutes before the ferry. So I wasn't really looking much at prices. I was just like running around grabbing things. But I remember some of the produce being expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of some of the, the staples at cafes and whatnot, I didn't find it to be more expensive. And regarding that tent, I think you listed, what was it, $17? Was that just for the spot or did it include renting the tent? Oh, um, so we, sorry, this is something I, I maybe forgot to mention. We did pack, uh, Micah packed a carry-on bag. So we did break the packing light and right rule. We did decide to bring our own tent and sleeping bags in a carry-on bag. It was really convenient with the rental car though, because we could just put it in the trunk and it's not like it was weighing us down everywhere we went, which is typically the reason we encourage people not to. Um, so yeah, we did have a carry-on bag, and that was Micah's tent. Ashley is curious, is it possible to see the Northern Lights on the Faroe Islands? I wasn't there at the right time of year. Um, I'm not sure. That's not actually, it wasn't on my radar, Ashley. Um, I wonder if um, my friend James in the guidebook says anything about that. Um, hmm. I'm not my, seeing, an, oh, no, I, no, I'm not seeing anything. So I don't think it's like a Northern Lights hotspot. I see, yeah. yeah. I could be wrong though. Well, Gabe, I think we have time for just one more question. All right. Marion is wondering if this spectacular trip to the Faroe Islands has inspired interest in any other remote islands or islands in general, like the Shetlands. 
Oh, absolutely. I think I've always been fascinated, but I don't think I'll be going to many tropical islands. I'm not a huge heat person, um, but I think certainly I would love to go to like uh, Svalbard, which has the furthest north city in the world where they have 120 days of darkness in the winter and 100 days of light in the summer. Um, certainly the Shetland Islands. Um, no, I definitely would like to, I, I enjoy those kind of isolated Nordic communities. The Lofoten Islands would be mm -hmm. another one. So yeah, I'd like to do some more island hopping soon. The Maybe Lofoten you Islands is an area and we'll, we'll put together an island hopping trip. Indeed, yeah, that would be excellent. And the Lofoten Islands are high on my list, actually. I would love okay, to. Well, know. then let's let's make it happen, Ben. Next year's trip report, Gabe and Ben in the Lofoten Islands. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Great idea, Gabe. We'll check in about that after the show. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I appreciate you tuning in, um, and I appreciated your questions. Thanks so much, Gabe. This was truly spectacular. And everybody, thanks so much for joining us. We have an exciting show next week as well. We're going to the U.S., to Charlottesville and the Shenandoah Valley with Lorita and Lauren. So see you then. Thanks again, Gabe. Thank you. Have a nice night, everybody.